Tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's October 2021, and this is episode 257, which is a conversation about how to share the gospel with a wayward child. Today's guest is Nicole Howe. She holds an MA in Cultural Apologetics from Houston Baptist University. She's a regular contributor to the quarterly apologetics publication, An Unexpected Journal, and a co-editor and a regular contributor to the online magazine, Cultivating Magazine. Nicole has written an article for our Effective Evangelism column in the Volume 44, Number 2 print edition of the journal. Effective Evangelism is a practical advice column on how to reach people of other faiths and of no faith with the gospel. Authors with experience witnessing to adherents of a particular non-Christian or unorthodox belief system share their knowledge and wisdom on approaches to breaking through the barriers that Christians commonly encounter with a particular group. Her title is called Witnessing to a Wayward Child, and our subscribers can read it for free at our website, equip.org. If you would like to read Nicole's article, please subscribe to the Christian Research Journal at equip.org. Nicole, it's good to have you on. Good to be back with you. It's been a little while. Well, this is a subject that is of concern to a lot of Christian parents because not every child, but some children do decide that they're going to renounce the faith and start embarking on a prodigal journey. And they can really relate to that parable where they've seen a child say, hey, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. I'm going to leave the faith. And so this is a unique article in the sense that you are an apologist, but you're also writing this evangelism article from the perspective of somebody who once was a prodigal yourself. And so tell us a little bit about your background and why it is that you considered yourself to be a prodigal at one point in your life. And that'll help us give some parameters to listeners to, you know, what, what are we talking about when we mean prodigal? And I know this is probably of interest, not just to parents, but people who have friends that they've Mm -hmm. seen decide not to follow the faith that they've grown up with or, you know, siblings. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I could probably explain my background with just a simple story because it really gives you a clue into how I was raised, I think. And it's an experience I had of of the way I came to Christ, which was around seven years old. And I don't even remember what prompted me to ask, but I, I remember standing in my grandma's kitchen with my grandmother and I just looked at her and I said, grandma, how do I know if I'm going to heaven? And my grandma was a faithful Baptist, and your granddaughter is not going to ask a question like that and get out of it. So she literally didn't even answer me and called the pastor of her church, and he was over at her house within I probably 10 minutes. Next thing I know, I'm in the living room with him, and he is leading me in a confession of faith, and I gave my life to Christ. I'm sure I didn't know what it all meant, but it did feel very sincere. And while I I wasn't raised in a Christian home where my parents were necessarily strong, committed Christians, but I went to a private Christian school. I was in church most Sundays with my grandparents, so I was immersed in Christian culture and very much wanting to pursue Jesus at that time. But it was a, a more fundamentalist upbringing. And by the time I was in high school, it was kind of a slow fade where in youth group, I just wasn't as, I I would say that more personal relationship. And so by the time I got to college, I stopped going to church. I, I never publicly renounced the faith or anything like that, but I completely stopped pursuing Christ and any sort of Christian walk from college and beyond. So that's sort of what I have in mind when I think about what a prodigal is, is you have a background, you've been rooted in the faith, and you 
really walk away. That's what prodigal means. It means to be turned away from. And that's what I did. I think that as a parent myself, you know, if one of my kids would wander away from the faith, that could feel very challenging to me. And also, I'm sure to all the parents that have experienced that, just kind of like you said, especially, I know that there's parents who've struggled seeing that exact same scenario that you're talking about. Their child goes away to college and it had been the practice of the family in which they were raised, you know, to go to church every Sunday and to be involved in the life of the church. And then all of a sudden, they hear that their kid is not going to church or is not interested in going to church. And like you said, that kind of fade. And so how should parents or siblings, you know, even approach that person? Because it's really different than another other evangelistic context that we can think about. Specifically, as I mentioned in this intro, this is an article that was published in our Effective Evangelism column because the person who is the prodigal, they've heard the message of the gospel before. Like I mentioned, they've been in a family where in your situation was your grandparents, but a lot of people I know who have seen their children wander from the faith, they were in families where it wasn't like occasional, it was weekly. They went to church every single week. So how is sharing your faith and approaching evangelism to the prodigal different than sharing with the person who's not religious at all? Yeah. Yes. I think that there's several issues with that. One you sort of hinted at is that we're not talking about somebody who's not familiar with Christianity. So you're talking about someone who thinks they know, you know, and I, and that's definitely me. I thought I knew what Christianity was all about and I knew what I was walking away from. And that's very different than somebody who's never been to church or doesn't know that context. So you have to keep that in mind. But even more than that, I think the personal dynamics at play when it is somebody in the family just adds so much more to complicate the scenario. I think parents can feel very personally rejected by this because they're not just walking away from a faith. They're walking away from the faith you worked so hard to instill. They're walking away from values that you hold, most likely. And so I know parents, and I know mine did, can struggle with feelings of helplessness, guilt, anger, even depression. Wayward children then feel misunderstood and isolated. And you also have this tangle of kids who are also just battling for independence, which is a normal developmental you know, that's a developmental season that all kids go through. And so there's some normal battles for independence there. And you have to separate what's just my child wanting to be independent from me and what's prodigality, you know? So there's there's just a lot that I think complicates this particular scenario. It's unique and it's tender. And it just means we might have to take a little bit of a different approach than we would say to somebody at work or to friends of ours, because of all of those other factors that are swirling around the whole scenario. Well, I'd like you to just kind of share with us a little bit more about your story, because if anybody has been watching the news or, you know, being online in the last several years, they've seen a lot of children of various different well-known Christian leaders, or they themselves were well-known Christians in music or in ministry, decide to deconstruct their faith and go away from it. And so, you know, how was that? You talked about fading away. What was just really causing the fade? You just weren't interested in Christianity anymore, or you didn't really see it as your own faith. And it seems like this is, you know, fairly common with various prodigals. And so how should people on the other side of it, they're watching this person, this sibling or this child go through this, how should that inform how they interact with them about spiritual things? Yeah, I think you just modeled beautifully first what to do, which is to figure out exactly what's driving them. Because We do hear this word deconstruction everywhere now. I wanted to write a whole article just on that section because there's so much to say about that. 
And what I've observed as I've heard different stories is that there are so many different reasons and so many different things going on in the mind of people who are quote, deconstructing. And I don't know that that word's always helpful because it means different things to different people. So I think first and foremost, don't assume that somebody's walking away from Jesus. Don't assume that they're walking away from truth. A lot of times that's the case, but we just can't know that. And you asked what was driving me. I think a lot of it, I I don't know that it was a conscious decision to renounce the faith like what we've seen with some people. I do think for me, it was much more of a fade away from just not being in a tight, close community where I was receiving truth. I think that's so important. We cannot be lone Christians. So as I went to high school and just was more immersed in the world and stopped going to church, I was just losing contact with the grace of the church body. And I do think that contributes to a lot of this. But at the same time, I don't think deconstruction is always a bad thing because there's a lot that is good to deconstruct from. And I can speak from experience in my own story that there was a lot that I needed to untangle. And I love the quote from Tolkien that says, not all those who wander are lost. And yeah, I definitely was wandering, but I I think it was a good and vital process in many ways for me. A lot of us have to untangle the faith we were given with our family culture and all the brokenness and dysfunction that can come with our family backgrounds. We get it all mixed up. It's all kind of in one big stew. And then you throw politics into that. I think a lot of what the deconstruction process is for some people is just trying to sort all of those pieces out, which can be a really beautiful process because when you're all done with that, you get closer to what the real truth is of Christianity instead of having it mixed up with all of these other things, if that makes sense. Do you feel like it was just things that you were thinking about that you weren't interested anymore? Or do you think it was specifically cultural influences or influences from friends? I know those are questions as to what are the, maybe some of the influences or reasons why somebody would start considering to wander away. Yeah, I've had like kind of two different wandering seasons in my life. The first one in college was a lot more culturally influenced. So like any kid in college, you've got all kinds of invitations, you know, around you to popularity and fitting in. And that was very much at play. I just wanted to live for myself and make my own decisions. I think it was far more of a rebellious journey at that point. But then years later in my 30s, I wouldn't exactly say I was a prodigal, but I had another crisis of faith where I very much, uh, I would say the influence there was questioning teaching, questioning what I had been given, questioning the faith that had been handed down to me. And is this true? Is this all there is? I'd never really gone through that process before. So I think a lot of times people are doing that kind of all at once. We might have legitimate questions, but then we use those questions as an excuse to just go live however we want. Sometimes it might be one or the other. Mine was a little more linear, but I definitely think a cultural pull And genuine questions about the faith are two big drivers that I've seen, and they were definitely at play in my own story. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. You won't want to miss out on our contest for free subscription to the print edition of the Christian Research Journal, as well as that Free subscription will give you access to all of our online exclusive articles on our website, equip.org. The way you can be entered into this contest is to go to Apple Podcasts and rate or review the Postmodern Realities Podcast by giving us a starred review, or even better yet, to enter in just a short one or two sentence review about why you like to listen to this podcast will help us out a lot. We're trying to reach 100 reviews by the end of 2021. Anyone who writes a written review after July 1st will be entered into the contest and we will contact you to have you give us your mailing address info to send you that subscription. You can also, of course, just purchase a subscription for yourself or for a friend at equip.org for thirty-three fifty. And also, if that is not in your budget right now, you can just give us a tip. That would help us out a lot. Any 
amount is helpful, even as small as $3. So if you want to go to our website, equip.org, and go to magazine, and at the drop down, go to Postmodern Realities Podcast, any of the landing pages will have a link where you can give us a tip. And we are so grateful for your partnership and really just help us spread the word. Simply tell a friend about this podcast. So you shared a little bit about your story, but you also mentioned a few moments ago that deconstruction isn't always 100% a negative thing, specifically because you were talking about, well, there could be family influences that aren't a part of, you know, Christian truths, but maybe you thought were or whatever else. So you made some new discoveries during your particular seasons as a prodigal. And how did some of these things actually turn into something positive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just where God's faithfulness is so clearly evident to me and my story. Because like I said, even though that first wandering was, was a lot more of a rebellion and a grasp for independence and cultural influence, in that season, I I know that God was using it to really reveal some new ways of thinking about my faith because I think one of the primary things that came out of that season was recognizing that I had never really understood the relational covenant that I had made with God when I prayed that original prayer. It was what we typically call a sinner's prayer. And while I know I was sincere as I could be at seven years old, I had a very narrow understanding of what I was doing. And it was like, get your ticket to heaven. I said the prayer, I'm good. And I know that contributed in some sense to why I felt like I could wander away without a lot of searing to my conscience. Because I assumed I had done what I was supposed to do. I had my ticket. And so what that kind of implicitly taught me was that what I did with the rest of my life really didn't matter. I was missing the relational aspect. I was missing the fact that what I did grieved God and that he missed me and that he wanted me to come back home. I hadn't really been taught a lot of those things. And so it was actually in my wandering that I sensed that from him far more than I ever had before. I felt his pull. I felt his tug and his call. And I think that was the first time that I really started to reevaluate what it meant to have a relationship with Christ. And I knew that it was more than what I had been given. So that was just one thing that I think I came out of with from this journey that was really positive. And I'm so grateful for that. And it only continued to change from there. I continued to ask more questions and grow deeper and discover more things about God that just were never evident in my family culture growing up. You know, you talked about you discovered some things on your own in terms of you know, just biblical truths about being in a relationship with God. But I think a lot of parents don't intentionally teach their children about the claims of Christianity. And so, for example, if our listeners missed it, we had a past episode on kindergartners need apologetics too. I mean, in every step of the way, kids need to understand at their age level what the Christian truth claims are, who is God, and so forth. Did you feel like that was a missing element? Because a lot of times people think, well, I'll just take my kids every week to church and the you know church will, they'll go to Sunday school and it'll all get sorted out. But the parents themselves don't intentionally teach doctrinal truth to their kids. Yes. I think that was a big factor in my story. Like I alluded to earlier, my parents were very committed to getting me in church, putting me in a private school, making sure that I was immersed in that culture, but it was not modeled at home for me very often. We didn't do family devotionals. We weren't talking about it. And I would say it was definitely more when I was younger. And then through circumstances in my parents' lives, that faded away for them as well. So by the time I got to high school, it just wasn't a huge part of our family culture anymore. And so I did lose guidance and discipleship at a very crucial time in my life. And so I do think that's a huge part of it. And I couldn't even really get into that part in the article that I wrote because this is such a huge issue. But I think 
it's absolutely crucial. That said, I still did have a lot of background, a lot, even at school and church. I memorized scripture. I was taught catechisms. I was in chapel once a week in the middle of my school week. I was in church on Sundays. I did Awana. I went to youth group. So more than a lot of kids, I still did have a lot of instruction. So I don't ever want to say it's only that because I also know prodigals whose parents were really good at all of that and still wander away. So there's so many factors that play into it. And that's definitely one of them and a very important one. And it certainly played into my story. I agree with you. I mean, as I mentioned or alluded to earlier in the podcast, there have been some very well-known ministers whose kids have, you know, wandered away and are what I would consider fairly anti-Christian, not just one, but several in the media. So I agree with you. You could come from a home where it is very much that you're doing family devotions and family prayer every day, and you're definitely immersed and your parents are teaching you. And still, there is a prodigal wandering for maybe one of the children. But one of the things that you talk about in your article is you talk about the value of imagination. And I do want to say that anyone who's a regular listener to this podcast knows that cultural apologetics is something that we do emphasize on this podcast. And we talk about, I think a lot of times people might wonder, why are we doing a review of you know, a popular movie or a television show or the latest bestseller, book bestseller? And so the role of imagination is really helpful in a lot of evangelistic contexts. But tell us how it can be something that's a really particularly useful tool when someone is engaging with somebody who is a prodigal. Yes. And I think this goes back even before your kids, you know, if they do, heaven forbid, wander away, this goes all the way back even before that happens of when we're talking about even how to instruct them when they're still under your care, because I think this was a missing piece, even though I had the instruction and church and all of that, this was a piece that I know is missing that I didn't really recover until my 30s in that sort of second prodigal journey that I talked about. And I just, it wasn't a part of faith for me growing up. I'd never heard about the role of the imagination. I never understood why it was important. And I think to understand that prodigals, especially today, I mean, all of us, but prodigals included, are inundated with information and truth claims and worldviews and instruction. And we're taking in information constantly. So sometimes it is not a lack of information. It's a lack of assimilating the information into meaning. And I love Dr. Ordway's quote in her book, Apologetics and the Christian Imagination. She says, this flood of data is just absolutely overwhelming. And the last cry of those drowning in nonsense is what does it all mean? We are really good at information, but we're not really good at meaning. And Proverbs 29 reminds us that we cannot be corrected by mere words. We aren't just brains assenting to a list of facts. We are human beings in search of meaning. We want to taste and to see the goodness of God. We can't just hear about it. We've got to see it lived out. We have to engage with it. And I don't know that that's always happening. And I know in my story, that was definitely something that was missing for me. And the imagination, Dr. Ward always says there's a difference between imaginary and imaginative. And I think sometimes in Christian circles, we hear imagination and we think imaginary. So there's no place for that when we're looking for truth because they're at odds with each other. But imaginative is simply what brings the truth to life. It it helps us connect the truth to what it means. And that's where I feel like you make the connection from the head to the heart and where faith gets really deeply rooted in our experiences, in our souls. And I'm really excited that I think the church is starting to come awake to the need for that. I love what CRJ does to bring that forward. And I think we just, we're only going to continue to see deeper faith the more that we integrate faith and reason and imagination. So specifically 
is there a good way that someone can engage a prodigal that they know on the imaginative level? Yeah, I think, again, I know parents now who have prodigals and the temptation is so huge to just keep pummeling them with truth facts and keep pummeling them with scripture and keep hitting them with truth. And I don't know that this is always effective. And so there are other tools that we can use that harness more power of the imagination and meaning. And I think stories are one of the best ways that we can do that. As Lewis says, they get past our watchful dragons, right? They sneak past our defenses. So stories are not confrontational. They're the shared language of humanity. So meeting your prodigal on the grounds of story can be a really safe place to try on Christian ideas without being directly confrontational. And I think starting with your own story is a huge part of that. And that was a part of my journey. My mom and I grew really close in my college years. And she began to open up more about her past and her upbringing, which was a huge part of mine because, you know, my grandparents are her parents and that my grandparents were a big part of my faith, as I talked about. So as she started to open up about her story and her background and what she'd been through, It just helped me put a whole new lens on so many things and really became the place that my mom and I reconnected and our relationship began to repair in ways that, I mean, it had been very broken when I was in college. So I just think your prodigal has a front row seat to your life. They know your story more than you probably think they do. And uh, the more you open up and are authentic and honest about that, I think it just scripture can be revealed through your experiences and your story far more than you probably realize. The great St. Augustine, what the confessions, when I first read the confessions, I was like, I cannot believe that this is, this is a memoir back in, you know, medieval ancient Christianity. We have a memoir. He's telling his story called confessions. That sounds so scandalous for a saint, (laughs) but it was so fascinating to me that even then the power of story and of course we know confessions has gone on to influence people for centuries and it's his story and and what i love about that is even inside the story of saint augustine is his story of how hearing other stories brought him to jesus so it was the testimony of other people that awakened him where he said he could truly see the folly of his own wandering was through listening to other people's stories. So we have a really strong precedent for the power of stories. Well, one thing that I think a lot of parents do claim in terms of a Bible verse for their kids is very well known, and that's Proverbs 2.26. You know, if you train up a child in the way that they should go, they will not depart from it. And, you know, a lot of times that's like the prayer that they pray, the verse that they pray, and they think, well, if I did these things then, you know, why is this happening to my child? Why are they walking away from the faith? Why are they slowly fading away? And it seems like if we do that as parents, it's a promise that our kids would not wander from the faith. And so, you know, how should this verse properly be understood, you know, given what we just said earlier, which is, There are a lot of parents, even people in ministry, who very much had a very robust Christian faith expressed at home. They had, you know, their kids had a good upbringing. I mean, there wasn't brokenness in the home and et cetera. And their child still wandered from the faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that verse, ooh, it's a doozy. And I think one, we just have to understand it's a general principle. It's not a promise. And sometimes that just takes, you know, good exegesis to understand when a verse is talking about a universal truth versus indicating just a general principle. So in all of my studying of that, I think it, we definitely can say it's it's not a promise. But I think, I think we do tend to read that and go, okay, I can bargain with God. If I train up the child in the way they should go, then God will grant me the outcome that I want. And I think we all instinctively know that that can't be right. And yet, Oh, I think every parent wants that to be true, but in no way does that scripture promise children will always be protected from the consequences of their own choices. Sin is a reality and God gives every single one of us free will 
But I think this verse, when we don't have the right understanding of it, can place blame on parents who will see their wayward children then as just evidence of their own failure. Well, I must have done something wrong. I must have screwed up somewhere. What did I do? And those aren't all... Sometimes that's a good self-reflective question to ask, but sometimes that's just not going to be helpful questions to ask in this context because it has nothing to do with that. No matter if you were a perfect parent, God was a perfect parent and we still rebelled. So there's a sin issue that is always at play. No matter what you do, your child becomes an independent free agent who can make their own choices. So even though you've done everything you can, that's not a guarantee. I think I have heard several scholars, and I couldn't tell you their names, who actually unpack this verse slightly differently and say the meaning is actually better understood as if you train up a child in the way they should go, the truth won't depart from them. So it's more of the groundwork that you've laid will stay with them. I heard somebody once say it will like, haunt them for the rest of their lives. And that's a little bit of a better understanding of how we should interpret what that verse is getting at. That's a hard one for parents to process because I think the average Christian parent does see that as a promise. So that was a good way to help us think about that verse. But one of the things that you emphasize also in your article is the role of prayer when it comes to evangelism and the prodigal. So This is probably easy to forget. I think there's a lot of probably worry or concern or fear when we see a child walk away or a good friend walk away from the faith. So how can prayer help, you know, not just the prodigal, but also the parents who are trying to navigate the situation? Yeah. I mean, I think parents of prodigals or family members of prodigals are some of the most faithful prayer warriors I've ever met because... There's nothing more uh, that you would want than for your child to be, you know, God loving and safe in his arms. And so it does, I think, initiate a fervent heart that wants to pray. Um, But I think remembering why we're praying, remembering that ultimately your child's homecoming is a job initiated and completed by the Holy Spirit. And it is true. That's true, of course, no matter who we're witnessing to. I think it's just hard for us to remember with those closest to us. And again, I I don't know this as a, I'm a parent. I don't have prodigals. They're too young, (laughs) but I know from my speaking with my mom that watching a prodigal is heart wrenching and the temptation to rescue them is absolutely overwhelming. So as much as we want to say, we know that this is the Holy Spirit. We know there's nothing we can do. I think we have all these conflicting desires in us that can cause us to step in and to thwart maybe what the Holy Spirit is doing to rescue, depending on the severity of your child's rebellion. If they're, you know, wandering off into addiction or really dangerous choices, then codependency can arise. Um, There's a lot of things, again, because this is a family dynamic, there's a lot of unique issues with prodigality that can come up that can pull you away from just grounding yourself in prayer and surrender and giving this over to the Holy Spirit. So just a consistent commitment to praying, I think, keeps the parent or the loved one in that position of surrender. And on that note, I would say if you're struggling with codependency or any of those issues, then a counselor, a good therapist who is informed on that can be very helpful as well. It's not just prayer, but prayer is definitely a a really important way to ground yourself and make sure that you are surrendering all of this to the Holy Spirit. I think that reminder that you told us that, you know, prayer is anchoring us in the the Holy Spirit and that it's the Spirit that brings change is really helpful because as you mentioned, and I think it's true, even if our kids aren't prodigals, if we see our kids fail or struggle, the immediate thing that we want to do is come in and fix or make their situation better so that they don't have to have those struggles. And so then it's even more difficult, I'm sure, for the parents who've witnessed their kids walking away and having struggles and not wanting help or trying to remove themselves from 
you know, family interaction and that kind of thing. So at that point you are left with prayer. So can you just maybe give us an example of how you've seen the power of prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit bring a prodigal home to repentance and restoration? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing in all of this is that, again, I can speak as a prodigal. I knew I was disappointing my parents. I knew that I was letting people down. I knew in some way because my conscience was was still sensitive and tender. I knew I was in the wrong in a lot of what I was doing. And so the tendency to want to hide is pretty strong. And prodigals can carry a lot of shame. So giving them that space helps them return because they want to please God, not because they they long to please their parents. That can be a really strong dynamic going on. And so releasing them and allowing that space can also just give room for God to move and to work. And that's where prayer comes in. So I definitely saw that in my own story. But I, for sure, going back to Augustine again, in his story, he attributes his entire homecoming to his mom, to Monica, who prayed relentlessly for him. And I love that he talks about that. And he, with everything that he could attribute his homecoming to, he says it was the faithful prayers of his mom, whose tears for her son, quote, gushed forth and watered the ground beneath her eyes wherever she prayed. I just love that we see this tender mother's heart in his story who would not give up. And she got to see him get baptized shortly before she passed away. So we don't always get those endings. It's not a guarantee. God, of course, doesn't always answer it the way we want. But I think reminding ourselves of those beautiful stories where prayer has powerfully provoked change and to be reminded that it really does do that can keep us from growing weary and doing good and can help us just persevere in prayer, even when it looks like we're just hitting a wall. Because we do have beautiful stories of rescue and redemption. It might take a long time, but it does happen. And I think Augustine is a beautiful, beautiful example of that. Well, you're talking to me today, so you're obviously not a prodigal anymore. And we tapped you to write this article about how to evangelize a wayward child. So what are other ways that you can encourage Christian parents and offer them hope, especially if they're in the midst of experiencing just really great heartbreak over seeing a child become a prodigal and walk away from the faith or or their family, or, you know, just like you said, seeing the slow fade to, to disinterest and it can just be very heart wrenching and can cause fear and anxiety. So, what hope can you offer them? Yeah, I mean, going back to story, I always just offer my story and offer the fact that if you had seen me in college, you, I mean, I have friends who knew me in college who are just, you know, it's kind of comical to see my life now an apologist committed to the faith, raising my kids, homeschooling, a Bible study teacher. It's, you just maybe wouldn't have seen it coming if you saw me back then. So I just stand as a testimony that there is no person who's beyond Christ's redemption. And I felt his presence. God loves your child even more than you do. And he hunted me down. He persevered. The hound of heaven, as the poets call him, he did that. And to trust that God is pursuing your wayward child, that he does have his eyes on them, that he loves them, that he is speaking to them in very, very, very tender ways that you might not even know is going on. So that's one thing is just to know that he is still present with them because he was always present with me. The other thing I would say is it helps to remember that we're all wayward in some ways. I think, you know, this dichotomy we can create between the lost and the found, we're all wayward. We have all gone astray at one point. And every single one of us who is praying for a wayward child or prodigal that we know was once in the same boat. So God's grace is huge because we can look around and we can see those stories of rescue and redemption 
everywhere, including in your own story. So to remember that God is actively rescuing, redeeming, and restoring in your life and in the lives of everybody around you. It's not just prodigals who've experienced that or returning prodigals. So remembering that the whole story of Christianity is about prodigals coming home in a lot of ways. So I think that's also helpful. And again, prayer was the thing that I can attribute to what really brought me home because my grandmother, as flawed as her faith was, and it was flawed, prayed for me every single day. And I knew that. I knew she was praying for me even when I was in college. And I don't know how to explain my story other than her prayer worked and it mattered and her faithfulness moved heaven in some way because that was ultimately what I turned to to come home was prayer. I didn't know how to change. I didn't know how to come back. I didn't even know what the path forward to that would be. All I knew to do was pray. And I just offered up one day a very simple, humble prayer. God, I don't know how to wake up tomorrow and be any different. I have gotten myself in a bit of a pickle. I've made a mess of my life. I am rolling in pig slop. And the father came running. I didn't have to figure all of that out. He met me in that place in so many real tangible ways, undeniably just showed up. So he is still doing that. There are testimonies of prodigals everywhere that can testify to the same thing. So don't give up hope. He's still working and he's still active. And did your family really try to pursue you or did you try to run away from their pursuits? Because I think that's another thing is, you know, like you said, you know, using the power of story, but how do you navigate that in terms of how much contact a prodigal might want to have? Yes. And I would say for me, um, especially in college, I didn't have a lot of contact. Uh, I didn't actually speak to my dad my entire college career, really. And my mom, it was very limited. So I did work very hard to cut my family off. And again, in asserting that independence. So they didn't have a lot of contact. They did not have a lot of opportunities. And that's a lot of times what happens, why prayer becomes our only recourse, because you don't have anything else that you can actually do because you don't have opportunities for conversation and you're, you're not able to engage or even share your story. And if that's the case, again, I can testify that you're still not without options because I think my family pursued me in prayer. I do think that was probably the primary way that they came after me, so to speak. So it's still a really powerful tool. And that's a good word. So now on a much lighter note, I have some fun rapid fire questions for Nicole. So not related to your story at all. So not an answer like that. But knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your 18 year old self? Oh, wow. That's a good one. I think I would go back and tell her to get more curious. I think I was really uncomfortable with the unknown back then, and I wanted certainty. And a lot of the things we talked about here, imagination and discovery and growth and transformation, have been such a huge part of my journey that I don't know I was ready for at 18. But if I could have been ready for it sooner, that would have been great. So I'd tell her to get more curious. If you didn't have to sleep, what would you do with the extra time? Oh, read, for sure. I sometimes don't sleep because I'm (laughs) reading. And besides your family, of course, and the Lord, what is the best part of your life right now? Mm, great question. The best part of my life right now, I think, is, is I'm in a time of transition and discovery of a clearer understanding of my calling. And that's been really, really exciting because at almost 42, tomorrow I'll be 42, I'm still working that out. But I'm probably closer to clarity on that than I've ever been. And that's been really exciting. Well, thanks, Nicole, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's always fun. You've been listening to episode 257 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was author Nicole Howe. 
She wrote an article for our Effective Evangelism column in our print edition, which is also available to read online for our subscribers. To read her article, if you are not already a subscriber, please go to our website, equip.org. And her article is entitled, Witnessing to a Wayward Child. We'd like to connect to you, so please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man YouTube channel and join in the conversation in the comment section and in the live chat when we have premiere videos. Please follow the Bible Answer Man page on Facebook and on Twitter. You will find us at Hank Hanegraaff, Bible Answer Man, Christian Research Institute, and Christian Research Journal, as well as on Instagram at the Bible Answer Man account. You won't want to miss every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern when we live stream the Bible Answer Man broadcast, hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff at our website, equip.org. In addition, please subscribe to the Hank Unplugged podcast. Hank gets out of the studio and into his study and engages in in in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations on critical issues with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. You'll want to head on over to equip.org because there you're going to find thousands of free resources for you in articles and past broadcasts, our podcasts, and videos. And thank you for all the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute.